pediatric orthopedic session and to introduce the judges i like to invite dr sanjay dhar president of bombay orthopedic society good thank you ashok good evening everyone welcome to this uh, probably the last but one episode of first round and today we have it dedicated to pediatrics uh, surgery pediatric orthopedics uh, we have i think four contestants today and we have two judges uh, who are very well known pediatric orthopedic surgeons dr rujuta mehta um, uh, who is uh, doesn't need any introduction in bombay orthopedic society one of the stalwarts of bombay orthopedic society and other is uh, dr uh, manda ragache again a uh, a uh, well known pediatric orthopedic surgeon they will be judging the sessions today besides i'll be there also helping and uh, the, for the students uh, to, uh, these uh, contestants dr ashok will uh, introduce them so over to ashok back to introduce the students i'd mm -hmm. like to invite dr neeraj bijlani secretary of bombay orthopedic society for the unit yeah so today we are going to talk on pediatric orthopedics uh, there are common topics so dr deepak jain will be talking on club foot management a review of the ponseti method dr rohit samani somani will be talking on slip capital femoral epiphysis current surgical techniques and outcomes and dr mudit shah who will be talking on surgical treatment of tars tarsal coalition current techniques and outcomes so tarsal coalition last time hua tha na kiska tha उटकमिंग So it's very encouraging for them, and uh, kudos to you all for doing this. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So, anyways, we'll we'll start with the first candidate, and I'll let you know the format how it goes. So, first candidate is Dr. G Deepak Jain. Deepak, you can start sharing your presentation. Yes, sir. And uh, so each presentation will be eight minutes. I'll be keeping the time, and I'll announce the time at the end of presentation. after the presentation we'll have question and answers from the judges and the sir and that will be the end of the first presentation and we'll go on to the second presentation so deepak you can start your presentation i'll start the timing now yes sir so, good evening sir uh, i am dr deepak jain from navi mumbai uh, i'll be talking about club foot management a review of the ponseti method uh, I I would like to thank the BOS for giving me this amazing opportunity and a good platform. So club foot, uh, as described by Hippocrates in 400 BC, even today in 2023, it still appears to be a challenge for most pediatric orthopedic surgeons because of its notorious tendency to relapse, despite of whether it it has been managed with conservative or operative means. So the club foot management can be divided into four eras. the era before ponseti and era during ponseti and later on post ponseti that is the uh, project prodigies of ponseti which took the ponseti technique ahead and then where we stand today so before ponseti we were trained to believe that all club foots require extensive surgeries and not simple surgeries extensive surgeries involving uh, tendo achilles lengthenings subtalar or posterior ankle capsulotomies including posterior medial and lateral releases at that at that point of time there were no uh, pediatric orthopedic trained surgeons that is before 1963 so there used to be a lot, lot of recurrences lot of under corrections lot of over corrections lot of relapses and lot of hydrogenic deformities yet the worst part was not the deformities but it was actually the pain stiffness and the weakness that used to come along with each surgery so one person is operating a uh, patient develops a relapse and then he goes to another surgeon he will be able to relieve the patient of his pain and the uh, the deformity but the weakness and stiffness which comes with each surgery there was nothing which can be done about it the one of the biggest pediatric foot and ankle surgeons at that point of time used to believe that amputation would give a better relief and long long term functional outcome to the patient than 
another salvage surgery. So that was the amount of morbidity before poncity of club foot. So uh, in 1963, Ignacio Ponsetti, a Span Spanish American physician, he came up with this uh, game changing technique of uh, manipulation, gentle manipulations, serial casting, and then bracing. So the Ponsetti method consisted of three phases correction phase, maintenance phase, and third was preventing and treating the relapse. The most important part, which was not considered in the Ponsetti's technique, is preventing and treating relapse. Preventing with following a strict bracing protocol. <laughs> and treating relapse, that is uh, a part of Ponsetti's method and not a failure of Ponsetti's method. So in 1963, he published a paper with 94 club fit in 67 children, and he achieved almost 97% of initial correction. But there was a high rate of relapse, almost up to 56%. In 1972, he came up with a follow-up paper where he uh, did some calorie dissections and uh, came up with a detailed pathogenesis and pathology what was happening in the club food and he came up with a extended bracing protocol which he observed uh, was uh, he was getting a lot of relapses so he came up with an extended bracing protocol almost in four years of age so people were thinking whether the kites method did not work why would Ponsetti work so they did not started uh, accepting this method of club food correction by serial casting but the actual game-changing paper or the landmark paper which changed the game entirely was by Cooper and Diaz in 1995. This was the paper when people started actually uh, uh, reading about Ponsetti. And this was a paper which showed that 31-year follow-up of Ponsetti's patients, which was corrected by Ponsetti back then, they came up with the 31-year follow-up of the same study and the feet, both the feet were indistinguishable, indistinguishable. They were not able to differentiate which was affected and which was not affected. The results were so good. This is actually started changing some uh, heads and people started reading about Ponsetti's method. This is a second hit which came along. That is the Congenital Club Foot, a book on, uh, by Ponsetti in 1996. So people started actually performing Ponsetti's method. Uh, and the next over next 15 years, the treatment uh, of Ponsetti uh, completely changed and everyone, most of them switched from surgical method to uh, conservative means. This was a survey done for the members of the POSNA in 2012. And it was seen that almost 97% of them have switched, completely switched to Ponsetti method and have not, are not using surgeries anymore. Then uh, papers from different parts of the world started coming along from Asia, Africa, and then everyone was started using Ponsetti's method. There was a survey done uh, 47 years after the first article and analysis which was done by CDC and it was found that in 2006 and it was found that the number of surgical releases complete drastically decreased from 1641 releases in 1996 to 230 releases, only 230 releases in 2006. So the surgical method came down from almost from 72% to 12% in 2006. This is a systematic review which was published in 2012 and it showed that uh, Ponsetti's method provides excellent results with an initial correction rate of almost 90% and just performing a simple tenotomy and it was the current best practice for the CTV. Post Ponsetti, what started happening is the prosody of Ponsetti, they started modifying the technique of Ponsetti. So Jose came up with a paper where he uh, modified the Ponsetti technique and he used to change cast every five days and the results were same. Another uh, technique was whether the age at the beginning of the treatment, whether it makes a difference. So they made two groups. Treatment started before six months of age and treatment started after six months of age. But there was no difference in the functional outcome or the number of cast or tenotomies. Later on, they started switching with the anesthesia, mode of anesthesia. So Ponsetti recommended uh, local anesthesia, uh, uh, the tenotomy to be performed under local anesthesia. Later on, Bohr came with his technique of light sedation protocol, which he mentioned that it was safe as compared to general anesthesia and can be used in slightly older infants, uh, whom we find difficult to uh, do it under local anesthesia. Then, uh, Zions came up with a paper with a propofol sedation method. So, the overall consensus was uh, under different anesthesia protocols. Uh, Tenotomy, performing tenotomy is safe, only it depends on the experience of the surgeon and the anesthesiologist. Later on, the uh, people started extrapolating his technique because Ponsetti mentioned uh, the bracing protocol and uh, the Ponsetti technique only uh, less than six months of age and 
uh, idiopathic club feet. People started extrapolating his technique for children older than six months, neglected club feet, arthropyopotic feet, neurogenic feet. People also started using his technique once they have done posterior medial release and patient came with a relapse. Uh, even consultees method worked in these uh, feet as well. So today, where we stand is basically the consultees method has taken missionary levels. It has been incorporated in government policies. It has been incorporated in various uh, various NGOs have started uh, working towards club feet. So to name a few, Cure India, Anushka Foundation and Miracle Feet. So this is data from one of the uh, Cure India Foundation, which was started in 2009. So they have the impact which they have today is they have treated more than 93,000 children with club feet. They have more than 360 clinics and they have trained over 7,000 doctors on uh, how to apply a quantity cast. So to conclude, Ponsetti's method is a gold standard. It provides 90% initial correction rate. There are uh, still relapses still there, almost 30%, but it can be still corrected with Ponsetti casting and uh, simple tenotomies. And I would like to emphasize the point, the junior uh, 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 fellows or uh, PGs to ICAS because if it is not translated or uh, extrapolated ahead, then people might st again start opting for surgeries and which might give poor results. Thank you. Thank you, Deepak. And uh, you took 30 seconds more than the allotted time. Uh, yes. Now I'll invite judges for question and answers. Uh, Rujita, ma'am, you can go ahead with your questions. So, Deepak? Uh, welcome to be the opening batsman for this uh, nice uh, initiative. Yes. So, well, so you have to review literature and all that great. But in your own personal uh, experience from your mentors to what you practice now, uh, are you saying that we have really, really wiped out surgery in club foot? Uh, no, ma'am. No. So, uh, what I have seen or uh, with my mentors is basically less than one year man we used to do quantity casting but once the child is older uh, slightly of higher age more than one year uh, we used to offer surgical releases because one of the reasons being uh, uh, the patient used to come from far away places like almost 800 kilometers 1000 kilometers away from the institute where we are uh, performing or practicing so it was difficult to call them uh, every week or every 15 days for serial castings and manipulations. So uh, we found it easy or easier to go ahead with the surgery. If the patient is from nearby place and is uh, can come for uh, regular visits, then it was easy. But to convince a patient uh, who is from far away place, it was difficult. Okay. Nanda, questions? So, yeah, uh, so Deepak, very nice presentation and uh, you have uh, quite quite well covered the positive management of club food. There are a couple of things which I would like your uh, uh, yes, views about. One is the accelerated positive method and whether uh, you have read about it and with uh, about the modified positive method for uh, the atypical kind of club feed. Yes, sir. So that is, these are two main things which I think I don't think you have touched upon. Yes, sir. Can you just elaborate upon these two? Sir, uh, yes, sir. First of talking about the accelerated method, sir, uh, there are two papers, one from uh, Jose Marquande, that is, he used to change uh, the casting every five days. And there is another paper, I am not able to recollect the author, sir, but they used to change cast thrice per week. So uh, what they have they, they, what they have published is they found similar results as what Ponsetti was doing. But what uh, uh, Ponsetti has mentioned, uh, sorry, uh, Mos uh, Vincent Mosca has mentioned in his paper is uh, the, de the deformities, uh, the bony deformity which is associated with the club foot. It takes some time to remodel uh, once you are putting stretching casts. So uh, it's better to put the cast for a week rather than changing cast every uh, uh, two days or every four days. So what the general consensus, what they found was it is better to keep a cast for seven days or even up to 15 days rather than changing cast repeatedly because the bony remodeling, it takes some time. 
that was for the first uh, this thing sir uh, accelerated method and second uh, the modified technique which they have described for the idiop uh, atypical club feet is uh, they have found good results up to 70% and what the modified uh, the modification in the technique is basically they use two thumbs and they keep on the plantar aspect of the foot and they uh, hyperflex all the metatarsals hyperflex uh, hyper so there is there is in atypical club feet there is a plantar severe plantar flexion of all the metatarsals so okay. in so they uh, the, what they have mentioned is you have to not just keep uh, thumb on the first metatarsal but keep your thumb on the fifth metatarsal as well and then hyperflex the uh, four foot no do you should hyper extend you should extend sorry, hyper the dorsiflex sorry, hyper yes hyper extend sorry you should dorsiflex the dorsiflex the, yes the yes. entire foot right yes yes dorsiflex. so the plantar is deformity has to be corrected yes, yes. where there is a severe plantar flexion at the midfoot yes, level that yes. has to be corrected in this case yes sir yes. last one, one question see whenever you think about ponseti technique and and uh, about uh, old patients or older kids the, the developing world always is important to review so have you read about any papers from this part of the world about uh, older kids and uh, ponseti technique i have read sir but uh, not recently like reviewing the literature for this there is one paper from uh, i think uh, wardia only sir but i i've read it uh, two, i think couple of years back not so one of the main co authors is sitting in front of you in front yes, of form of dr ujita yes. mehta yes, so sir. i had hoped that you you will uh, at least review mention and review that very nice article where yes, uh, they have uh, studied their results about uh, older kids and ponseti method right so and whenever there is a review of literature there has to be something which is topical for the current population yes right yes sir so very nice deepak i think uh, ashok we can go for the next one so thanks judges and there sir any questions from you no so, i think mandar I, i wanted to ask the same question means you uh, whether i missed it but mandar has now pointed that out so you have you done any literature review about the same thing probably i think it will be a repetition now that in older children ponseti how effective it is literature wise means what is the time limits when you should probably still do it and we have not seen any literature vis a vis success rate with its the existing method like i belong to a era where pmr was very popular and in fact we used to do it. but what is the to convince the person like me what is the literature backup for that so although we see great success of ponseti's technique but what is international literature and indian literature say about that, that was anyway mandar is sort of so i will just add to that quickly that what he would really be uh, advised to read up and it will be benefit uh, beneficial for the reader uh, viewers as well that there are very good papers from dr shah alam khan and anil agarwal from delhi and okay. from yeah. wadia about yeah. the walking age club foot treatment with serial casting we don't call it really ponseti anymore because ponseti classically is described only in neonates yeah. so yeah. for walking age serial casting up to 10 years of age we have been doing it but there are some modifications and caveats which apply to it and for non idiopathic feet so syndromic feet these are the two main successes so both those papers from wadia you can look it up from jpob let's go to the next thank you ma'am and all the best thanks deepak for your presentation thank you thank you, thank you. next is dr rohit somani rohit you can start sharing your presentation yes sir again the time is 8 minutes go ahead make it full screen okay we can see it full screen is it visible sir yeah it is visible you are audible go ahead with the presentation okay good evening everyone uh, i am dr rohit chamani assistant professor at sgs medical college and km hospital thank you bos for giving me this opportunity to give a presentation on slipped capital femoral epiphysis the current surgical techniques and its complications 
uh, just to overview the methodology, the search engines that I've used are PubMed and Google Scholar. Some of the keywords that I've used have been highlighted. And these are some of the textbooks I used to go back on the old knowledge. So what do we know about uh, SEFE? It was first described in 16th century, popularly as a misnomer, as we very well know that uh, the, uh, the epiphysis, the capital epiphysis continues to be in the acetabulum and it is the femoral neck and the shaft of femur that is displaced anteriorly and superiorly, that is most commonly. It is uh, seen most commonly in males uh, ranging from the age of uh, 12 to 5, 15 years, averaging at around 13 years and girls uh, at around 11 to 13 years. Highest prevalence is seen in pollination children and uh, the least is seen in the Indo-Mediterranean population. Risk factors, we have obesity as one of the most common risk factors. Uh, uh, children who are obese at around 12 to 15 years of age have around 17% higher chances of getting an uh, SEFE. There are endocrinal abnormalities like hypothyroidism, renal uh, failure, mechanical variations in anatomy like the epiphyseal tubercle, uh, the size of the epiphyseal tubercle, which has been into the focus quite recently, and the vitamin D deficiency, which has been commonly noted in the Indian population. The risk of bilateral involvement in SCFE is around uh, 20 to 40%. And approximately 50% of these people, they are present at the initial presentation. Now, moving on to some of the, just revising what are the commonly seen radiological features of SCFE. We have the Klein's line, which is supposed to intersect the epiphysis at this point, but it does not intersect in SCFE. Then we have the Blanche style sign of steel. Then we have the physial widening and we have the sham sign. Now, uh, again, revising on what all the classification systems that have been described in the past. First was the temporal classification given by Boyer et al. It was based on the time. Acute, chronic, and acute on chronic. Acute is less than three weeks, chronic is more than three weeks, and acute on chronic is when it's more than three weeks with acute exacerbation of symptoms. Morphological classification based on the extent of displacement of the femoral epiphysis relative to the neck based on the calculation of Southwick's angle. We have mild, which is less than 30 degrees, moderate 30 to 60 degrees, and severe more than 60 degrees. Lastly, we have the functional classification, which is uh, given according to the patient's ability to bear weight. It was given by Loder et al. in 1993. So we all know Dr. Randy Loder has done a lot of extensive work in SEFE. So he gave this two things, that is the stable SEFE if the patient is able to bear weight and unstable SEFE when he's unable to bear weight. Uh, just to add one more thing, uh, there was another study which was conducted in 2009, I believe, uh, wherein it was found that stable and unstable, although clinically important, uh, do tend to pose a different picture intraoperatively. Now, moving on to the management, which is the topic for today. Uh, once SCFE has been diagnosed, everyone agrees that uh, the patient should get admitted and bed rest until prompt definitive management of the SCFE has been undertaken. Acute displacement of the epiphysis after diagnosis of a mild chronic slip has been documented quite repeatedly. The primary purpose of a definitive management should be to stabilize the capital femoral epiphysis to the femoral neck in order to prevent the further slipping. So application of a spica cast, bone wrap, epiphysiodesis, all of these techniques have been inscribed previously, but we don't follow these techniques uh, quite often in the recent times. In situ internal fixation and pinning, open reduction of the epiphysis and compensatory osteotomies. Most authors agree that once FESC is diagnosed, surgical treatment is indicated, but significant controversies regarding what is the best type of treatment. So first thing that we know about is in situ pinning or fixation. It is the classical treatment of SCFE. It has stood the test of time. Initially, it was described for both stable and unstable SCFE, regardless of the degree of deformity. Uh, one cannulated screw or multiple Kirchner wires across the growth plate was what was described. The ideal position, the center of the neck and perpendicular to the growth plate. So several methods have been described for uh, placing these screws and wires. We can either use a traction table or a radiolucent uh, fracture table or a radiolucent table. But the essential thing is to remember that the anterior starting point uh, that is needed for the screw to go properly in the center on the lateral view and on the AP view, you have to go uh, perpendicular to the physis. 
and also another important thing to remember is that uh, we have to pass at least four threads distal to the epiphysis some of the common uh, controversies that are there in in situ fixation whether do we use a multiple screw or single screw now uh, most of the people say that multiple screws are needed but there is no evidence of biomechanical advantage between the use of multiple screws over a single screw second most important thing is the relative inferior position of the screw in the epiphysis we have to avoid the superior and anterior quadrant of the epiphysis because that results in uh, avascular necrosis of the femoral head thirdly we have to use a fully threaded screw preferably a stainless screw is preferred and a large fragment screw stainless screw preferred over titanium because titanium has problems in removal therefore because we need to screw, uh, remove the screws after the physial closure complications of these uh, percutaneous spinning there are chances of further slippage avian was reported in around 10 to 40% of patients chondrolysis when we penetrated the joint and uh, loosening of the screw screw back out and a uh, future subtrochanteric fracture and uh, very commonly noticed uh, which was given by alstrida et al was that there was an unsatisfactory reduction in moderate to severe slips which led to a hump deformity in the upper part of femur which led to fai and early oa this is what we've been understanding in the past uh, decade about it screw fixation with minimal reduction this was initially described by loader et al and uh, later in his own paper and by kitano et al they said that on the only significant predisposing factor for close reduction uh, uh, for avian was close reduction either purposefully or inadvertently in acute acute on chronic and unstable acfe so this is something that we do not do anymore there is uh, close reduction is strict no then came the open reduction and internal fixation so it was initially done who described the subcapital osteotomy shortened the femoral neck in order to preserve the blood supply to the femoral head in 1964 as we can see that the retinacular vessels on the posterior aspect they used they tend to get stretched when we are trying to reduce so this part of the neck was osteotomized and uh, reduced and fixed but uh, it was uh, people found it difficult to reproduce the results that dan had in 2009 zebrat et al proposed a combination of dun capital osteo subcapital osteotomy along with gans safe surgical dislocation of hip which came around in 2007 this was this came to be known as a modified dun procedure it was very well uh, indicated in moderate to severe slips unstable slips must be reduced in less than 20, 24 to 48 hours and uh, uh, as dr uh, mandar sir and uh, uh, sandeep vaidya sir did a study in around four years back where they proved that these uh, results could be reproduced even in the indian population i think till date it is one of the largest uh, studies in the indian population so what we did is uh, this is just briefly describing the technique resection of the posterior callus with a short retinacular release when the retin retinacular release is done it prevents the uh, perioperative overstretching of uh, vessels then uh, this also gives us an opportunity to treat the associated le lesions that is the early acetabular labrum and cartilage jam damage the metaphyseal bump which limits the internal rotation leading to fai which can occur even in milder slips so the drawbacks of this modified dun procedure is that it has a absolutely long learning curve as, and it is a technically demanding surgery the decision between its use whether versus in situ pinning is often based on the surgeon experience rather than the available evidence as was said by novice and et al so the complications there is a, as with any other uh, procedure slip progression instability growth arrest residual deformity chondrolysis and osteonecrosis so this was reported to be around 47% in the unstable hips even after doing a modified done procedure so then uh, once the com uh, Um, osteotomy or uh, the acfe was healed and came in the picture of doing of compensatory osteotomies they were not intended to achieve anatomically or aligned epiphysis the correction at the site of deformity meant that we are risking the blood supply to the epiphysis and therefore it has not found uh, wide acceptance as of the initial done procedure most commonly now we use the cuneiform epiphysis osteotomies at the base of the neck like the kramer or barmada and the intertrochanteric osteotomies with the southwick and emhauser 
So the base of neck osteotomy is uh, indicated to correct the residual deformity after the closure of physis. In theory, they posed less risk as compared to the interruption, uh, interruption of blood supply to the femoral head than the done procedure. But in practice, uh, not many have been able to re uh, reproduce these results. The base of the neck and uh, femoral neck being extra capsular, this osteotomy is believed to avoid the femoral neck and head blood supply. Coming to the intertrochanteric osteotomy given by Imhauser and Southwick, this has been termed as a biplane osteotomy, and he recommended that it be performed at the level of lesser trochanter. The Imhauser procedure is uh, performed slightly higher in the intertrochanteric region of the proximal femur. Now, the problem with uh, both of these pro proximal femoral osteotomies is that they created an unwanted deformity that may complicate a further hip joint processes. Most authors have re uh, reported poor results with them, as I have mentioned in the literature over here. Cuneiform osteotomies have also given poor results, although I did uh, come across a, a study which was published in 2022, which said that uh, cuneiform osteotomies have better uh, results as compared to the done procedure, not the modified done procedure. Nowadays, since we have a better understanding of FAI, a pathomechanical process, which uh, SEFE can be an initiator for, uh, it has renewed an interest in the direct correction of deformity following the SEFE. Now, uh, once we have sorted as what can be the treatment, there comes the important question of prophylactic filling. Whether prophylactic prevents SEFE, it is not in, uh, while it prevents it, uh, the SEFE in the contralateral hip, it is not entirely a benign procedure. As was indicated by Sankar W. and et al., the possibility of developing complications such as AVM, peri-implant failure, implant prominence, and infection uh, did persist. So patient selection is very important and whom, in whom do we do these pinning? So uh, as very commonly we know that high-risk patients, where patients who are hypothyroid, patients who are obese, patients with renal uh, diseases and vitamin deficiency, we can go ahead and do a prophylactic pinning. Now chronological versus skeletal age, which was given by modified oxide bone age score, this has been said uh, to be the single best predictor for the contralateral skip. As was, um, so we use these uh, five criteria. Uh, and if a total score is coming to be between 16 to 18 in the modified Oxford bone score, then we have to go ahead and pin the opposite side. Then another criteria was the posterior slope angle, which is said to have a poor clinical utility given in the O. o Yang Y et al. study. Now, another thing uh, to be noted uh, is that in the Indian setup, what is the role of prophylactic pinning? Since majority of the patients who might come to us, we might lose them to follow up. So uh, it is very well advised that if we are suspecting that the patient might not follow up, despite them not having these high risk chance uh, indicators, we might choose to go ahead and do the prophylactic pinning. Now, con coming to the more uh, rarer things, the anterior and valgus slips. In rare cases, uh, the displacement is either superior or posterior. It is the so-called valgus hips. And even more rarely, the neck can go only anteriorly. Then uh, they may present with either stable or unstable hip, like is seen in the typical SCFE. In valgus hips, there is restriction of abduction, adduction and flexion. And in anterior slips, there is limitation of external extension and external rotation. The treatment for these valgus or anterior slips are highly individualized. In situ uh, pinning has been described, but again, uh, it depends, varies from surgeon to surgeon. Open graft, open bone graft epiphysiodesis has been, uh, still comes back as a savior, as an alternate reasonable approach if percutaneous pinning is inadvisable or unsuccessful. Coming to the complications of uh, SEFE, two of the most dreaded complications that we have are avascular necrosis of the femoral head and the chondrolysis. AVN is the most frequently uh, seen in treated cases of SEFE, particularly after closed or open reduction of unstable hips or osteotomies around the femoral neck. The incidence in unstable hips is up to 47% per percentage. So a uh, short treatment, uh, articular surface, if it is intact, use a revascularization procedure. If it is not, you might be better off to go a joint arthroplasty or a fusion. Chondrolysis, 
uh, it is basically a condition where there is a destruction of the joint cartilage. The patient complains of stiffness and persistent pain in the groin or upper thigh region. The diagnosis of this is uh, highly, uh, most commonly a diagnosis of exclusion. Recent studies have indicated that MRI can be useful in chondrolysis uh, detection. The patient presents with reflection, abduction, and external uh, rotation difficulty. Radiographically, we can see a loss of more than 50% of joint space as compared to the affected, unaffected contralateral side or an absolute measurement of 3 mm or less. So conclusion, what do we conclude from all this? Despite all controversies, one thing is clear that surgical intervention is a must and there is no role of conservative management. Close reduction must not be performed at all cost as it does not give us control over the retinacular vessels. Modified done procedure, as said in the studies mentioned, is a great technique in the trained hands with reproducible results. If the person is not trained well, then you might be better off doing an in-situ pinning for a temporary uh, basis and refer them to a higher center. Moderate to severe slips must be corrected to an anatomical uh, as anatomically as possible in order to prevent the FEI. This is a short uh, uh, flowchart that I could make regarding the same. If the patient comes to you with a diagnosis of SEFE, if it is stable, if it is mild, do an in-situ pinning. If it is moderate to severe, even if it is stable, go ahead and do a modified done procedure if you are trained well enough. If it is unstable, you have to go ahead and reduce it. These are the references I've used. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Roy. But you took like double the time allotted to you, more than 16 minutes for your presentation. I'm so sorry. You need to time your presentation if you're making it. The time allotted has to be, it has to finish within that time limit. That is one of the major criteria for any kind of presentations you will do in future in podium or online. So you need to take care of that. Not the presentation was comprehensive, but it needs to be delivered in the allotted time. So over to judges for questions. Uh, Rujita, ma'am, you can start. So uh, I fully agree with Ashok that you don't have to put the entire textbook out. But what you need to distill from your uh, uh, what you read up is what is going to make an impact and what has impacted the uh, treatment of SCFE in the last few years. One very important technique that I didn't see mentioned anywhere unless I missed it and maybe Mandar heard it. Um, uh, what about the PARS uh, technique? Yeah, I think all of yeah us, ma'am. I did uh, go through it, but I... I uh, haven't finished yet. Yes, so that is very important to mention because that is something which is useful in day-to-day -day life for general orthopedic surgeons. And the other important thing, which is a raging controversy still, which you should have touched upon, is an incidental reduction. So I think Amanda will throw more light on that. But these two things are important when you're talking about uh, delivering a presentation for the understanding of the audience as to what has impacted or changed the management in SCF in the last few years. Amanda, your comment. Yeah, thank you, madam. So, uh, Rohit, as uh, Ashok said that uh, it was too long, you should really work on work on uh, managing your time, right? That is one thing. Secondly, you said that you did a literature search and you searched the PubMed with these uh, terms. But the, the presentation was not a literature review. It was just a just a just a sort of a lecture which you probably will give to PGs about what are the management options. That is not what is a literature review. Literature review means you have to review certain say ten excellent main articles in the last ten to fifteen years which have impacted practice, right? And that is how a literature review has to be done. You said that you used a few key words. Uh, in your literature review, but that uh, that was not put forth in your presentation at all, right? So that is one thing. Secondly, you said something about uh, as as Madam said, Parsh method is something which is extremely important to to mention, and that is something which you should do. Uh, there have been a number of papers in the recent years about pros and cons of the modified done osteotomy method whether it has to be done or not, and whether it can be done in the stable slips or not. That is something which has to be mentioned. I think Chris Souder from Rady Children's Hospital uh, has a very landmark article. 
I think in 2014, where he mentions about uh, various aspects of uh, uh, management of stable slips. There are also another uh, few other articles which you did not mention. You said something about the epifacial tubercle. Now that is something which is which is important. Raymond Liu, I think, first mentioned it in 2013, followed by Eduardo Novais in 2019 or something about the method of um, the utility of epifacial tubercle. And that is something which is very important, especially in the classification of slips. So I think I think uh, it was a good effort, but I think you should have put in more effort in order to make it more recent and uh, trying to uh, follow what we wanted. Probably there was uh, uh, there was some misunderstanding about what we wanted versus what you have put forth. Yes. Probably. Yeah. The thing. One last question is: You said something about short retinacular release. What do you mean by short retinacular release? Uh, sir, so the uh, modified done procedure, uh, we after doing a safe surgical dislo dislocation of the hip and uh, you have to release the uh, retinaculum subperiosteally. Okay. So, so that uh, you can get, uh, you can relieve the posterior, uh, epiphyseal, uh, posterior epiphyseal vessels of the tension and you can uh, remove the uh, callus form that is po uh, the posterior medially formed callus. And in order to be able to reduce the dislocation uh, and the slip. Okay. So one thing, one word which always has to be preceded of, from, from retinacular flap or retinacular release is not short. It is the exact opposite of short, which is extensile. So it cannot be a short release. A short release is an is an invitation for avascular necrosis. So it has to be an extensile retinacular release and that is the only way in which you can save it from AVM. Right? So that is something. So you should be careful about using these words. It's not a short retinacular release at all. All right? Okay. So I think Dhar sir uh, is here. Dhar sir, if there are any no, questions. Any questions? No, no, that's all. Both of them have already. No questions. Okay, sir. Thank you, Roy, you. for your presentation. Let's now I'll invite the third con contestant, Dr. Mudit, to share his presentation. Go ahead, Dr. Mudit. Again, the time limit is eight minutes. So stick to it. Is my screen visible? Yeah, it's visible. Go ahead with the. Yeah, screen. is it okay now? Yeah, it's okay. We can hear you. Okay. okay, go ahead. So, good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Mudit Shah, and my topic for today is the management of pediatric supracondylar fractures, the surgical techniques and outcomes. Now, uh, Chanley had described the technique for reduction of supracondylar fractures, and we follow the standard K wire fixation that has been extensively described in literature previously. The things that are not very much in uh, controversy. Are two minimum uh, lateral pins, which are 2 mm, uh, two mm in size, uh, either in the parallel manner or in the divergent manner. At least one wire should go through the capitulum. The trans olecranon four cortex purchase gives good stability. Cross spinning is always more stable, which has been uh, recently again uh, reiterated by Lee et al. in 2022. And uh, the earlier thought of having a pin spread of about six to eight millimeters is now uh, given a more objective answer of one third of the total fracture distance on the distal humerus. The pin spread should be at least one third apart, which has been mentioned by Dr. Venkat Das in his recent article in JPO 2022. Now I have uh, supracondylar being a massive topic. I have tried to answer four important questions related to supracondylar whether surgical technique can be defined by the type of fracture and for that if the Gartland classification is sufficient, when and how to do a medial pinning, do we need to fix supracondylars immediately and can we see a fracture and try to prognosticate it so that it's better to speak to the parents about it in practical situations. So Gartland had given his classification in 1950s. However, in 2008, JPO, uh, Michael Bach et al. with Sponsilla 
had defined the path classification which was for gartland type 3 supracondylar fractures he said a typical transverse fracture can be easily managed with lateral pinning a lateral oblique fracture which has an oblique uh, obliquity of the fracture with a massive lateral uh, part of the distal humerus can be again managed with a uh, lateral pinning however if there is a medial oblique fracture where the obliquity is giving you a massive medial chunk of the distal humerus it has to have cross pinning because it will require a medial pin he described the high fractures as a fracture exiting above the olecranon fossa but in the distal humeral metaphysis which will again require a cross pinning with a medial pin to achieve adequate stability and get good cortical purchase on both sides in the for both columns uh, importantly he said that he divided sagittal types into two a low and a high low is where we can use a standard pin fixation a high is where the obliquity will require you to probably modify your pin insertion in a way so that you are perpendicular to the fracture line to achieve maximum stability now we are going to see some outliers which are very important to diagnose on x rays so that we can manage them better and quicker so the reverse oblique was one of the most important outliers described in jpo 2019 by hefferman et al he said that the reverse oblique fractures are fractures which extends from the anterior cortex proximally to the posterior cortex distally producing an anterior spike on the distal fragment these are associated with a lot of soft tissue issues like ecchymosis and ai and palsy suggesting a high energy trauma these fractures cannot be reduced by conventional methods like described by chandley he said in order to avoid open reduction he recommended since these fractures always have a posterior lateral uh, displacement we should try to move the lateral uh, distal fragment laterally and try to bring it anteriorly and after this it becomes a typical supracondylar fracture which can be reduced and pinned as per our uh, normal techniques of lateral pinning the flexion type of supracondylar was very difficult to manage and people recommended using a trans olecranon pin which was described by uh, brandon green in jpo he said that once the coronal alignment is good we can pass a trans olecranon pin to maintain the coronal alignment uh, sorry the sagittal alignment i'm beg your pardon and once the sagittal alignment is acceptable we can manage the coronal alignment and fix it lateral pinning now dr viraj singhare and dr swapnil kenny being co-authors in this paper from korea mentioned about reducing irreducible fractures they said that if we give an anterior incision over the uh, antecubital fossa uh, and try to push the proximal fragment with a thumb or suction tip we not only try to reduce the fracture but we also decompress the fracture hematoma so for this example he said that you push the proximal fragment posteriorly with a thumb or with a suction tip and once you achieve adequate reduction you can pin them easily without going for an open complete open reduction now the from egypt they described the intrafocal technique in 2009 which was being used for distal radius fractures as well they said by doing an intrafocal technique we can try to reduce the difficult fractures and the bending of the wire in fact acts as a good lever to hold the fracture position and pin it similar paper had come for uh, for a joystick method for the proximal humerus in 2009 they said that if the component is only a proximal uh, humerus rotation we can put a proximal uh, we can put a wire in the proximal fragment of the shaft of the humerus and try to derotate it once that is done we can easily pass wires and fix this fracture now this paper from china recommended using the stab incision where the mosquito forceps is inserted and in the mid uh, triceps level and we try to reduce the fracture through the fracture line once done hold the fracture in position and pin it when to do a medial pinning and how to do it so medial pinning has been indicated in four situations high fractures medial oblique fractures fractures with medial combination and unstable fixation now how to define an unstable fixation this was described in jpo 16 they said that if a gartland type 3 is there and we do a close reduction to lateral pinning we can check on external rotation and compare it with an internal rotation as you can see here in internal rotation it seems to be a little mal rotated so they recommended putting an additional medial pin for these kinds of fractures the normal way of putting a medial pin has been 
the elbow extension and placing thumb over the medial epicondyle and passing it through the medial epicondyle, which has a relative risk of 1.1%. Using a nerve stimulator, intraop, USG machine and neuromonitoring might not be the most practical approach, although it has a risk of 0% as described. But using a mini operin approach and the sleeve might be useful, like this described in JBJS 2021. They said, instead of passing through the medial epicondyle, we can pass a wire through the flexor pronator mass and avoid these injuries. They had less than 0.01% of ulnar nerve palsy in these cases. Do we need to fix immediately? They said, at night, there are only three indications. Presence of a pink pulseless arm, motor nerve injury, and displacement of cortex by 25 mm, either in the AP view or in the lateral view. Can we prognosticate a fracture? In 2015, BJJ, uh, Korea uh, authors had described the high and low fracture. They said the low fractures are prone to have issues with uh, stiffness. So they recommended it might be better to speak to the parents beforehand to understand their problems related to joint stiffness. Medial spike in BJJ 2013 was about the medial spike angle less than 45 degrees and the fracture tip skin distance less than 6 mm. If either of these are present, there is a high chance of the fracture going for an open reduction. Type 4 fractures are very difficult to manage and they recommended that if the fracture has a flexion angulation, valgus angulation, lateral translation or an osseous apposition or cortical contact between two fracture surfaces or the fracture line is going towards the diaphysis of the proximal segment, then we should think that these fractures are actually type 4 and prepare the OT staff regarding the same. I hope we have been able to answer these questions. These are my references and thank you everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Madhav. Uh... You took around 35 seconds more than the allotted time. Anyways, let's ask the judges for questions. Uh, Rujita, ma'am. So I think we can discount those 30, 35 seconds yeah. for both of them, the first and the last presenter. Yeah. So very nice um, uh, review, Mudit, and great idea to pick out what was the most important uh, kind of, you know, four aspects that you wanted to review. Um. There are actually two nice papers I would like to draw your attention to where now they say that it's better to, especially when you're dealing with the type 4s or the reverse types, where it's better to go ahead and do a minimally uh, invasive anterior approach just for the sake of fracture reduction. And uh, one of them is our own Indian author, Dr. Prasad Gaurineni, who pretty much recommends it. And the other one is a close friend and a woman orthopedic surgeon, Imel Gunan from Turkey. So what are your views on that? I mean, how long you should you go on struggling or should you go ahead and just do that anterior uh, mini open? And Thank still you stick question, to your lateral pinning. Thank you for your question, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, I think that uh, to go for an open reduction, one should have very low threshold or even for a mini open. In fact, there is a paper in uh, 2021 from JB, uh, BJJ, which says that open reduction has the same kind of outcome as uh, as close reduction in a long-term follow-up when it comes to uh, the outcomes radiological and clinical. However, they have not uh, taken into account the scar issues and uh, the issues related to parent reported outcomes. But uh, I feel, ma'am, if there are signs, there are red flag signs of a fracture like puckering. And uh, if you if there are signs of uh, any neurovascular compromise where like if it's a, a cold hand, it's a, a there's a vascular compromise. Definitely, we should go for an open reduction and not think too much before going for an open reduction. However, uh, a mini open can be done as described by Dr. Viraj Singhade in 20, uh, 2009 as well. I don't think uh, we should try too hard to try and uh, reduce, I think uh, maybe about three or four attempts and about 10 minutes of operating time should be enough to decide whether this will come in a uh, close reduction or whether we should go for a mini open and try to uh, get, get an anatomical reduction and fix it with a lateral pinning. So why do you think people have had reservations about it in the past? Since you're saying you want to lower your threshold, most yeah. of us have a very high threshold for going ahead with an open. So why do you right, think people have reservations in the past? I think, uh, <laughs> ma'am, uh, with open reduction, I think everyone has reservations, but literature somehow suggests that uh, they are 
equally when it comes to clinical and radiographic. So what was that one one fear uh, because of which uh, people would not go ahead with a open reduction in the past? I I think, ma'am, the neurovascular was something that everyone was worried about and uh, uh, trying to uh, kind of manage that might be a difficult in setups which are not capable of handling such complications. So, uh, otherwise, I don't think open reduction should be uh, uh, so much of a uh, problem. If you go anteriorly, yes, it is a problem. However, lateral approach and medial approaches have been uh, described to go for an open reduction as well, where they go laterally and medially, depending on the direction of the displacement of the fragment. Okay, let's not go uh, waste too much time on this discussion because I think these are eternal things. So let Mandar ask his question and then maybe if there's time permitting, we'll come back. Yeah, Mudit, uh, quite well, uh, very comprehensive uh, literature, very nice. Uh, a couple of suggestions. I think, uh, so when, when you talk about major points, like when do you operate or a type 4 supracondylar, the original landmark articles regarding that topic I think you should mention. I think the Cincinnati article, which uh, I think Al yeah. Alvin Crawford had authored, that was, I think, the most cited article of that year in the ABGS. So that is one thing which uh, I think you could have mentioned. The second thing is that the original Type 4 supraconductor article, um, which has been published, that also needs to be cited rather than the corollary to it, which is, I think, by Shonekar where he has yeah. mentioned those four criteria, which which are... Uh, so whenever you put forth the point, I think a very landmark article, if it is there about that point, that can be mentioned ahead. And then probably uh, 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 the recent one. I know that you were uh, rest for time, but I think these are a couple of things which uh, you could have uh, mentioned. Sure, yeah. But Thank overall, you. I think it was uh, quite well covered. Any any you, paper sir. you think you've missed out on? Something many, that we still try to do? Uh, okay, many. That's good. I'm like, you know, honestly. Uh, uh, ma'am, actually, I, I felt supracondyl is such a massive topic. I course. have not even touched so upon pink, pink pulseless so hand at all. I think yeah. all, all three topics were really huge. So that's why what we want to see your skills as the rising star as to what you're able to sift out out of it. Yes, uh, ma'am. Uh, one paper I would like you to definitely I wish you could have added to this was about the dog and pin. Yeah. And uh, how to do a safe, effective, medial pinning, but through the lateral approach. Yeah. And That's the correct. problems associated with it. And I think like uh, Mandar uh, pointed out to Alvin Crawford's article, even Sheetal Parikh has got uh, uh, about the timing of the uh, supracondyler. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So these are Less important hours from recent hours. literature point of view. But otherwise, I think all three have really made a very good effort. And I think the challenges was, was really big because all huge topics were given to them. So my request to Ashok and Neeraj will be that if there is a next batch, give them a focused area to uh, gather literature on. It will help uh, us to judge them better. Yes, ma'am. And there, sir, any... Uh... Yeah, any questions from sir? No, something similar, which I think Dr. Rajita said. Um, uh, in a pink pulseless hand, where you have sort of an anterior puckering or you have the proximal fragment coming out, if not a full compound, but it's just jetting out, means what does the literature say whether you should still try posterior? I think she asked you that, but if you had any literature backing for that, you should still try posterior uh, this uh, conventional technique. Or you should directly go anteriorly. Is there literature uh, any so, clear uh, for this? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, so uh, basically uh, the recent literature which talks about firstly the timing of uh, management of a pink punchless hand, uh, they consider it to be one of the uh, supracondylar orthopedic uh, emergencies that should be managed as soon as possible. And they recommend in 2021 uh, as uh, they have recommended that we should do it as soon as possible. Firstly, by doing a close reduction and by checking whether after doing a close reduction and pinning, if we are getting an adequate, whether one, we are still having a good perfusion, which can be in the form of having uh, 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 the color, the color being good, the pink color being good, or sometimes uh, we can get the pulse back as well. 
uh there have been some articles that have used doppler as a uh, guiding uh, you know uh, like a guiding instrument to understand whether the uh, doppler can be used where they check whether it's a monophasic flow or a triphasic flow but uh, uh to my knowledge sir i could not find any article that spoke about opening the fracture site in a case of uh, pink pulseless hand on the first instance uh they have always recommended to go for a close reduction and pinning as the uh, first uh, uh you know first management protocol kind of a thing however if okay. it becomes a white hand uh, then they obviously recommend to go for a brachial artery exploration yeah i remember a, a, an anecdote now when i was in cyan i did one supracondylar right fiddle i struggled with it a lot but ultimately i opened it and my boss told me would you have done the same thing to your son i said yes sir i would have done the same thing because i couldn't get the reduction and that's what anyway that was besides thank you <clears throat> so thank you mudit and thanks all the contestants for their presentations today i'll invite the sir to uh, thank the judges and invite their inputs regarding the program today thank you ashish thank you uh, dr rojita and dr mandar for taking your time and encouraging these people because it's a, a real pleasure for somebody who has just started to present to his peers uh, they might criticize you but then that gives you a lot of uh, ability to um, improve yourself in the future and that is what we all plan this so that you have that stage fair and you are actually talking to your own peers whom you always look forward and look up to so thank you very much dr rujita and dr vandar once again for being there thank you very much uh, rujita man any comments on the format and the session today the format is actually very nice uh, uh, i would just say that you know when they are conceptualizing this uh, what they are going to talk about they need to really focus on uh, especially because this is a competition and you are talking about bos rising star they need to really focus upon what they want to convey to an mixed audience they'll be they're going to be pgs in the audience they are going to have uh, uh, your own colleagues seniors in the audience so what is your target audience usually defines how you are going to structure your talk so that is something which they should really really keep in mind so you need to balance between being informative at the same time not becoming too didactic or just like a monotonous thing you need to be able to showcase what you've understood out of the topic and what you want to share so that the interest level of the audience you need to really be able to hold the audience uh to yourself for all those 7 8 minutes and prevent them from dozing and that's going to be a long journey a lot of us are still struggling with it ourselves but it comes with practice it comes with time but i think if you first put the audience in the center space you put the spotlight on them then you will really be able to craft your talks better and better then oratory skills presentation skills will also come over a period of time and that's i think something which bos really works hard at mentoring but if the thought process is right usually it will shine through so i think that is a very important message for uh, the next batch who will be preparing hopefully okay thank you ma'am uh, mandar your comments yeah it was an excellent uh, initiative uh, this year for uh, for uh, making an effort to find the rising uh, people in, in in their respective field and uh, this format is very good and um, uh i think i think as madam said slightly focused more focused topics will be better because 8 minutes to to cram up uh, topics like club foot and skiffy and supracondylar is a bit difficult though they really made a very good effort to to condense the topic to that particular thing the other thing which i think uh, i think mudit did uh, well here is where he has he had put forth the points what he was going to elaborate so i think that is a good uh, uh sort of a template for other people where they can they can have the points which they are going to speak about that particular topic so he may not talk one person may not talk about the entirety of supracondylar but probably four or five topics in supracondylar which he wants to elaborate and probably have a few uh, literature points about it 
so i think that is one thing which can be uh, suggested thank you manda yeah. and uh, as we know the viewers rising star will uh, culminate in viro uh, 2023 so we'd like to play an invitation video for viro and then ask the sir to invite everybody for the viro session so i'll share the video Like thank you uh, go ahead sir yeah i take once again take this opportunity to invite everyone i am sure all the participants and judges are there definitely but i invite everybody else who has been watching this program to for wirock wirock promises you always uh, by its own reputation and by co uh, continuous uh, line of uh, conveners and uh, uh, secretaries uh, it is a conference for everyone uh, and i am sure it is totally unbiased it doesn't promote any uh, political presentations it is uh, simply academics and i welcome you all and i can assure you that we'll uh, this year also we have a very fine program lined up and, and great exhibition and a great networking opportunity welcome to everyone okay thank you sir so thank you judges and thank you all contestants we are coming to end of this session and uh, we'll meet you soon next week with the next session of mixed bag thank you very much thank you good night everyone good night bye 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 sir thank you